ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next episode of Whistle Talk. Uh, tonight I'm going to do something uh, I've only done once before. Tonight we're going to have a little bit of a solo show. So it's just me, myself, and I, Mike D, the referee. Um, tonight's show, what I'm looking to uh, pass forth to everybody is just some of our pregame communication stuff. Me being an umpire, I've actually had my first white hat game of the season coming up. Uh, I've had many other white hat games, but coming up this uh, upcoming weekend, I will have my first white hat uh, game of the year. Um, so it's actually a refresher course for myself, but also something that I do on the daily, well, not the daily, but on the weekly with my head referee as the umpire. So tonight I'm going to dive deep into our pre-game conferences with not only our coaches, but also with the crew itself. So I'm going to dive into that. I will have a couple of links that I will share with you. Um, I'm going to have a couple of different documents that I will also have available for you on my Facebook page and on the website. Okay, you could find the website right there. Go to Whistle Talk. You'll see the link. Okay, search up Mike D, the referee, and you'll find it. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, if you are enjoying our show, please make sure to hit that like and subscribe button for all the people that are out there that might be new to the show. Hit that like subscribe button. It is free. doesn't cost you a penny. Um, and it just helps me out with that whole algorithm type of thing. And lastly, before we begin our show, I've got my little buy me a beer. So if you're really enjoying the show and you want to say, hey, Mike, you want to know something? You're working pretty hard there. Have a beer on me. You can go to this link. You can buy me a beer. Think of it as a uh, as a tip. But once again, absolutely no requirement. So if you're like, Mike, no shot. Completely understand. Not looking to, to, to retire off this podcast. I'm looking to get out some information. So again, you got buy me a beer. Um, go to the website to take a look. And uh, on Facebook, I will also have those different links. So the first thing that I'm going to share with everybody, let me open up my screen here, share my screen, is just what I do for my coaches pregame conference. So now you'll see here, let me try to zoom this in for my people that are able to watch it right now. But now, as the referee and also as the umpire, I'm out there with our head referee, and we're going to go to both coaching staffs, and we're going to go to our home coaching staff first, give them the courtesy of being the home team, and we've got a couple of questions that we're going to that we're going to go through with them. Um, there's always a little bit of small talk. Hey, how's it going? How's the season been? You guys healthy? Um, and for me, I know a lot of the coaches around the area that I that I referee at, so sometimes it's uh, how's the family doing, different things like that. But uh, once we get the small talk out of the way, we're going to dive right into our business. Um, and question number one, and I know this has been a hot topic for a lot of people, are your players properly equipped? Um, we've talked about it to nausea with the knee pads, with the visors, with the eye black and all those other fun things. Um, but here's now where we're asking the coach, coach, are all of your players properly equipped? Um and 95% of the time, it's, oh my gosh, I'm so tired of hearing that. Yes, they are, they are properly equipped. I ripped them last game, uh, blah, blah, blah. They're just going on and on about it. And, and sure as heck, coming on out, you got the kids with the knee pads rolled up and whatnot. But we're, we're asking the coaches. Now we're putting the onus now onto the coaches. Hey, make sure your guys are properly equipped. We don't want to have to deal with it. We don't want to be the uniform police. We want to be here to officiate a good game. So coach, please take care of it. And it's amazing all the times now that we've heard, and, and this is something new. And, and if you guys around the country, you guys and gals around the country have heard this one, uh, it's just my pregame face mask, or it's just my pregame visor, they say, um, which I don't really get, but they'll come out with a completely black tinted visor, which is not good by NFHS rules. Uh, but they, they, oh, I'll take it off at pregame. I'll have my knee pads down uh, once the game starts. All right, well, you've been warned, so next time we have to deal with it, you could get booted out for a singular play until it is uh, remedied. 
Uh, next question we're going to go on talking about the equipment. You have anybody with a cast or a splint, anything that we got to inspect. Now that's going to fall on me as the umpire. And when I'm the white hat, I'm going to pass that along to the umpire. We just want to make sure that if they have that thing clubbed up and at the high school level around here with the trainers, done a really great job of making sure that, that the foam padding is covering up any hard casts or different things like that. So now we start getting into the actual football stuff, getting away from uniforms and that type of thing. Um, and now we start trying to find out plays. Coach, do you do anything that you want us to keep an eye out for on for your side? Coach, are, are you running any type of trick plays or unusual formations? And again, I've talked about this with a couple of the other coaches that I've had on. Please, coaches that are listening, let us know what you guys are doing. We don't want to bang you for an illegal formation um, when it's something that if you would have told us pregame, we could have talked it through. I've even had coaches come up and show me a diagram. Okay, we're going to do this formation. Um, is this legal? Is this not legal? And, and we'll talk it through. So just let us know beforehand. Yeah, coach, we've got a double pass. Um, we run a lot of screens, different things like that. Uh, and we'll talk it through. All right, with the double pass, make sure you have that first pass going backwards. And it's not technically a double pass because it's a backwards pass. So we all know that that is legal. Um, so different things like that. So coaches, let us know. Let us know if you're running any type of muddle huddle so that come an extra point, we're prepared for it so that we have the right coverage and we're not hitting you again for something that could possibly be legal, but when we see it for the initial time, not only is the other team caught by surprise, but we're caught by surprise. We're out of position, and maybe you don't get the proper call from it. Uh, next thing we're going to do is we're going to move on to the other team. Coach, is there anything on the other side of the ball that you've seen on film that you want us to take a look at? This is where we're going to start seeing and hearing. Um, yeah, can you watch number 99? He likes to cut block. Um, he, he, different things like that. They do different things like that, or, hey, they run a lot of screens, or they're a heavy RPO team, which I know we're all dealing with. Um, they're a heavy RPO team. Can you just make sure to watch the linemen going downfield? Yeah, coach, absolutely. Um, another one that we've had happen recently is, hey, can you keep an eye? Their defensive ends or outside linebackers like to cut our guards when we're pulling Okay, which is an illegal cut block, which is an illegal block, even on the defensive side. So they're letting us know that they saw that on film for us to keep an eye on. So again, we're looking for honesty, be open, be forthright. This is not something we're going to take to the other side and say, well, coach, that coach over there says that you're doing this. This is something for us and for our crew so that when we go into our pregame, which I'm going to talk about next as a crew, we're able to relay this down and trickle down so our whole crew is ready for it so moving on any special concerns about the game yeah this is a big rivalry game we've had some stuff going on in social media these are some of the answers we may hear um it's homecoming we're gonna have a 45 minute halftime eh, no you're not but different things like that is there any type of special concerns or sp special type of things going on with this game that we need to be made aware of now, a lot of times my head referee passes it off and I'm going to share with everybody also my card that I use as an umpire. But here now I'm going to start getting the numbers and the names of the captains. And not only for me, the captain's numbers, I'm also going to get the center's number and the center's name. Because again, as an umpire, I'm going to go up to each center pregame and have a short little conversation with them saying, hey, listen, my name's Mike. I'm going to be over the ball with you guys. When I'm giving you my hand, when I'm giving you the palms up, don't even touch the ball. I got to make sure that our chains are set, that our other officials are ready. So me as the umpire, I'm kind of dictating the tempo of the game. And going back to one of the previous questions, hey, guys, we're a no huddle team. So can you get the ball spotted quick? Absolutely. I'm going to hustle my butt off, get the ball spotted, work to get myself out of there. But I also need to make sure that we have all the other officials in the right spot. So me as the umpire... I'm kind of setting the tempo. Me as the white hat, I'm relying on that umpire to make sure that I'm in the right spot, giving my signals, first down, whatever it may be, winding the clock before the other teams come out and try to quick snap the ball. Um, so then some other questions that we're going to go down and we're going to ask your quarterback, righties or lefty, kickers, righties or lefty. So as the R, 
The kickers, for me, make a big difference because when it comes to extra points and field goals, I want to be on an angle that I'm facing the holder. So I can see down and I'm facing right into the holder. So knowing if it's a righty or lefty does make a difference. For those people that are working with the five-man mechanics, this also makes a difference on who is going to be going underneath the go post to signal along with the deep guy who has, um, if the field goal is good or not. So this is a communication thing that, that we're always going to be working on. Uh, today, quarterbacks-wise, for, for me here in New Jersey, I'm always going to be in the offensive right side of the backfield. So righty or lefty quarterback, it doesn't make a difference. Um, but with the five-man mechanic, a lot of times we were, again, facing the side of the quarterback, facing their chest, basically, as they were dropping back. So a right-handed quarterback, I'd be on the backside right. Left-handed quarterback, I'd be in the offensive backfield's left. Um, And then the last couple questions that we're going to ask the coaches is who's calling the timeouts for your team. Um, We've had it at times where the head coach is up in the booth. So he's going to designate their offensive coordinator is going to be the one calling the timeouts. Um, And then lastly, for me as an umpire, this is one thing that I need to know, but who's your ball person. I want to get a ball in relayed as quickly as possible, get the ball set, get it going, let the play move on. Um, and then also for my side officials, for our wings, we, we, want, we want to know who the get back coach is. Who's the person that I could say, hey, coach, we need everybody to back up. And then they're going up and down the sideline screaming, hey, everybody back up, get behind the numbers, get behind the line, whatever it may be. Just again, to keep it safe for us, the officials, and keep our area clean. Last thing that we're going to go over, um, and I'm picking this up from my particular white hat that I work with, is... It's not a question that we're going to ask them, but it's a, it's it's basically a broad statement. When it comes to an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, we don't like throwing them. We don't want to throw them, but we are going to throw them when needed. So if we see that a game is kind of getting a little bit chippy, I'm going to go over as the white hat and I'm going to say, hey, coach, can you keep an eye on number 79? And that's it. I'm, I'm not going to tell him to pull him. We're not going to tell him to get him out of the game. We're not going to tell him that he's ejected, anything like that. I'm kind of putting it now onto the head coach's shoulders. Like, coach, just keep an eye on number 79 or have a talk with number 79. Whenever you get a chance, I want you to know that we know that something is going on. We don't want to hit him with the unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, but if he doesn't control himself, it's going to happen. And also, coach, I'm going to give the same courtesy to the other side. So if I see something going on and it's number 54 on the other side, we're going to give them the same courtesy. Two unsportsmanlike conduct penalties on one particular player in the game, that's an ejection. Not only are they out in the state of New Jersey for the remainder of that game, they're out for the, pre, the, for the next game, I should say. So it's something that we don't want to do. Um, but I will tell you, in a recent game we had, we had four. We had four unsportsmanlike conduct penalties because the team, it was a rivalry. The team couldn't control themselves. We had two touchdowns with uh, excessive celebration. So, I mean, it's still out there, but we're trying not to throw them. But when we have to, we will. And the coach actually was, was very courteous to us after the game. He's like, listen, you guys do a great job. There was nothing that we could do with those taunting penalties. They're out in the open for everybody to see. We got to hit them on those. So he addressed it with his players. Uh, one of the players he pulled out because it was, I guess, his second or third unsportsmanlike conduct penalty of the season. So the coach was kind of fed up with it. But we, we want to communicate that with our coaches and let them know, hey, we're going to ask you guys to help us out before we throw the flags on that. Again, this goes back to our preventative officiating that we've been talking about throughout the whole segments, throughout all the different shows, the preventative type of officiating. Let's nip it in the bud when we can. Let's talk to the kid. Let's talk to the coach before we have to throw that hanky on the ground. So these are just some of the things that I am asking as the white hat. And now let me share with you a, another screen here my umpire card and I'll have this umpire card available for everybody to take a look at. Um, and again, you can download it. You can have it. This is free. This is just something that I made, uh, picking up off of the Smitty card and picking up off of a couple of other cards that I've seen out there. I had decided I'm going to design my own card for, for what I like, for what, for the information that I utilize the most. So, These are index cards, so if you have plain white index cards, 
These are easily printable. You just flip them. Um, but so now I'm getting the captains down. Again, I'm also going to get that center's number. So I've got the home team, their color, the coach's name, the name of the ball boy, the get back coach. But then I've got all the information here and any type of special notes that the home team might be giving me. Again, they're, uh, they're running screens, um, this trick play, this particular formation, so that when I get in back with my crew, I can relay that information. Flip the card over, and then you got the visitors team. Same type of information. Okay, and then I also have our coin toss results that are right there, what they want to do. Um, I, I kept it on the home side too, just... Uh, just to have it there, but basically it's going to be your visitor side of who won or lost because they're the ones that are going to be making the call. Scroll down, I now got my score. Um, and I've filled this card up maybe once or twice with, with some crazy games, but I'm putting the quarter, I'm putting the time, I'm noting the home score, so how many points they scored, if it's a field goal, if it's six points for a touchdown, if it's a touchdown and the extra point, or if it's a touchdown to two-point conversion. I'm putting the score here, the point total here, and then the total of the team here. And then once the visitor score, I'm doing the same thing, and I'm just filling the card down. So this all should match up time-wise. Quarter has everything there, so I know who's scoring, what time they scored, what quarter they scored, and what the total score is at that time. Then again on the bottom, I've got my ball placement. So at the end of the second quarter um, and the end of the third quarter, I'm sorry, going into the second quarter, going into the third quarter, I should rephrase that, whose ball it is, the down, the distance, the yard line, and if they're going in or out. So now when we flip the chains because of the end of the quarter, I've got all that information logged. I'm making sure that I mark the ball in the right spot as the umpire, place everything down, and we're and we go from there. The last portion of the card, and again, these cards are, I have two cards, they're double-sided. So on the back of this card now, I got the date, the kickoff time, conditions. A lot of times I'm not truly filling all of that stuff out. But here now is where I'm going to keep track of penalties. And I know in, in different states, um, some people designate a particular official to keep track of every penalty. I know at the college level, in the NFL level, they're tracking every single penalty that's called okay me as an umpire i'm putting down the unsportsman likes okay i'm marking down the unsportsman likes so you can see here i've got the number the home or the visiting team what quarter it happened the time that it happened and if the player was disqualified or not so this is something that i have with me when i go back and do my game notes i could go back and now if i have to report this to our association or to the state Number 16, got disqualified because of two uh, unsportsmanlike conduct penalties. One happened in the uh, first quarter at seven minutes. The other happened in the fourth quarter with uh, 11.50, so right at the beginning of the fourth quarter. I've got all this information down so that when I report it, I have everything there for me. So, again, I'll have a copy of this card. I'll, uh, this is on a Google Doc. Both of those cards um, that I showed you are both on Google Docs. And that coach's pregame card, that's also a, an index card that I carry out with me to go down with the coaches. So I kind of remember, uh, just so I have everything there. A lot of times I don't even refer to it, but I have it there in case I need it. So, now I've gotten all the information from our coaches. Now it's a matter of, okay, everybody does their pregame. Once one team in the state of New Jersey exits the field, we as officials, we vacate the field too. So we're standing in, in, in specific positions. And again, this is a mechanic that your state might have it a little bit different. Um, the R and the U, we're typically standing at the 50-yard line. But now our other officials are kind of patrolling back and forth, looking at the teams, checking out, making sure that the wristbands are in the right spot, that they're not around their belt, making sure they're not wearing any of the bracelets, the visors. So this is our time, again, preventative officiating, that we're checking out the uniforms of both teams as they're doing their warm-ups. Um, typically, the end of the warm-up period tends to be some type of team segment. So Team A will line up with their backs on their 40-yard line, so they're kind of screening off the other team from seeing what's going on. 
this is a great time for us to just kind of walk the line, introduce ourselves, talk with the kids, um, but also check out their uniforms, make sure that they are properly equipped to what the coach said they were. And again, the reminder, hey, son, make sure that you have that visor taken off or when you come out, make sure that back plate is covered up, your knee pads are covered. Now, once one of the teams leave, we wait for them to completely exit the field. Now we go back into our locker room or our area. We've actually had some tents at some schools. Sometimes it's a locker room. Sometimes it's a cafeteria, whatever it may be. That, that's, that's irrelevant. So now when we get in there as a crew, I've got some nice fun things that I'm going to share with you again. Let me go to share my screen right here. And now this is what we talk about as our crew. So this is typically led by our referee, uh, our white hat. And a lot of times, again, with our crew, we're, we're six people crew here in New Jersey. We've heard it enough times. We've been with him long enough that we all kind of know exactly what he's going to say. But it's still good to hear it again. And then he'll look at us. Did I forget anything? And we're like, yeah, uh, the kick game or whatever it may be. So... This is just something that I'll have printed out and I'll keep in my equipment bag with me um, just as reminders that when I'm a white hat, I like to go over with with whatever crew that I'm working with. So the first one we talk about is keeping the flags deep. OK, um, especially I, I have in here in my notes, this could be the player's last game. We never know when the player is, is not going to be playing. So let's let them remember the game and not remember us. So keep the flags deep, make safety fouls and point of the attack fouls our emphasis, dead ball officiating um, fouls. We need to kill those, okay? But let's try to keep the flags as deep as possible. And again, that preventative officiating, that's always one of our key things. Second one is whistles. This is one that, that my head referee has really ingrained into to our crew and it's something that does drive me nuts when I, when I fill in or when I'm on a different crew, it should only be one whistle each play. The end of the play is over when the play ends itself, the play ends and then we blow the whistle. We don't need three whistles. We don't need four whistles. We need the covering official to have the whistle. And 90% of the time, this is going to be the wings. Uh, let me rephrase that. Probably about 99% of the times, this is going to be the wings. I very rarely, as an umpire, blow my whistle to end the play. Because I don't have the forward progress spot. I don't see those different things. Now, I got a beanbag. If I see a fumble, I could possibly overrule the wing. But I'm not really blowing my whistle. There's no reason... For a deep wing on the home sideline to be blowing a play dead on a toss sweep to the visitor sideline that only gains two yards. This is where the inadvertent whistle happens, ladies and gentlemen. This is the cardinal sin time. Let the play end. Covering official blows the whistle. That's it. There are times where the ball is run up the middle. Me as the umpire, short wings don't see it. We might not have a whistle at all. Nothing. Dead silence. Other than now my voice. Roll off, roll off, use the ground. Let's go. Everybody help each other up. Different things like that. Talking to the kids each and every play. But I'm not blowing my whistle. Sides aren't blowing their whistle. Because we're trained, if you don't see the ball, don't blow the whistle. So the runner can be down. Play is over. Me as an umpire, I'm going to stick my hand up in the air just to signal to my short wings that, hey, I've, I've got it dead, but I'm not blowing a whistle because there's times when my hand started going up and all of a sudden that kid popped back out. So only one whistle. Keep the whistles away from your mouth and try not to play with the whistle in your mouth or try not to officiate with the whistle in your mouth. Me as an umpire, I've got it in my mouth pre-snap. Once that ball is snapped, I'm spitting it out. Same thing with the short wings. I know a lot of short wings will use two whistles. They'll have one in their mouth pre-snap to get any type of false start, different thing like that. The plays that we have to kill right, right away. But now once the play starts, let it go and then come in with your finger whistle. So try not to have multiple whistles. 
Next reminder that we'll do is our kick game. And we'll talk through the kick game. We'll talk about anything that happened crazy in the last game that we got to remind ourselves about. Different things like that. Again, this is where the game gets a little nuts. Wings on the punts, umpires. Okay. As an umpire, I'm kind of cheating once that first flow of traffic goes past me and I know that it's clear for me to kind of spin. I'm going to kind of take a look back to see if possibly if I can help out with the muff, if I could see if somebody did hit the ball or not. Our deep wings are going to be there. Our short wings, we got our initial keys as our short wings, but then if we can kind of perif that punt returner, we want to make sure that anything on that ball we get. We don't want to miss those punts. We don't want to miss those muffs, those touchings, anything like that. So let's all kind of help each other out. Make sure that we get a... a a good fair catch signal. And again, this is where we remind the guys, our deep wings are going to be reminding the returners. If you're going to fair catch, make sure we give some concise swings over the head. Give us a good, good look with that. Uh, and we're going to, we're going to kill it right then and there. So now we got those covered. We've talked it through. Now we're going to start talking about flags. My crew, we're very big on no me too flags is what we call it. If you see something, throw it. Don't fish in somebody else's pond. If there's a hold at the line of scrimmage, you may see two flags come out because I'm watching the point of the attack and maybe the short wing have it, and we should have two flags basically landing on top of each other. But if there's going to be two, possibly three flags on the field, we're looking for two, possibly three different penalties. We don't need to have everybody throwing it. We don't need to have that extra flag thrown on top just to say, oh, yeah, I'm just confirming what they saw. I saw it too. Uh Uh-uh. If you see something, throw it. But if you see somebody else threw it for that, don't throw the one on top of it. It's not needed. Okay? And again, flags screw up the game. We don't want to throw the flags. Refer back to number one. Flags. Keep them deep. Moving on, we talk about the sidelines. We'll always go over the sidelines. Um, Our crew does a very good job of communicating with the coaches, of staying back. We very, very rarely have sideline warnings, let alone any type of 5 or 15-yard penalty on sidelines. We take control of that, but our white hat, myself as an umpire, we don't want to deal with that stuff going on on the outside. Wings, that's your domain. Keep that area clear. Keep that area safe. Police it yourself. Talk to the coaches. Again, let's go with the preventative measures. Communicate, communicate, communicate. So we kind of just pass that along to them. Continuing down. And again, this is something else that we've talked about already. But as officials, we want to hustle. We want to move. We we want the kids to have the best game possible. So we want to hustle, but we don't want to rush. And, And that's a key little term that that we're always throwing and reminding each other out. Hustle, but don't rush. Make sure we're seeing what we're seeing. Make sure we're getting to where we need to be. But let's not do it in such a hasty manner that our head is bouncing all over the place, that we're missing our keys. Okay? Hustle, but don't rush. And this now goes back to my communication that I'm having with the center. I'm setting the tempo for the game. Even if it's a no huddle, even if it's a two minute drill, I'm setting the tempo. I'm making sure that everybody's good. And then I'm busting my butt to backpedal out. I'm hustling out to backpedal. A lot of times I'm not over the ball, but my voice is communicating with the center. Don't touch it. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Hustle. Don't rush. So here in New Jersey for our varsity games, probably about 90% of the time we have a chain crew that is assigned from our association. Um, But there are still other schools where um, to save some money financially, they use their own people. Some of them are volunteers. There's there's one particular high school that they have volunteers, but it's been the same three gentlemen that have been doing the chains for about 15 to 20 years. I remember going down when I was coaching and they were on our sideline as the visiting team. But as a white hat, Talk with your chain crew. Have a conversation with them. Let them know that they're there to do a job too and to keep their conversations to a minimum. On here, I say keep your conversations clean, but don't talk to the coaches. If they have a question and they start asking you, refer them to me, the white hat, okay? If we screw up, let us know at halftime. 
We all come together. Let us know. But when you're on the sidelines and you're running the chains and, and you got the box and you're standing on one sideline with coaches and players, they hear stuff. Oh, God, I can't believe Mike called that play. Well, now the coach hears you saying that and questioning me or questioning our wing. And now they start going nuts and they don't even know what they're going nuts for. Um, I've been in a situation where we had a chain crew, certified officials that were on the chain crew, almost get into a, a full-fledged argument with the coaches on the sideline because the coach didn't like a call. Well, that's up to the coach and the officials that are on the field to deal with, not for the chain crew. Chain crew, excuse me, coming through with the chains, back up, please. That's it. Talk with your wing guys. Um, when I was a cadet, when I was first coming up, and all we were allowed to do was hold the chains, I held the box every single time. I was on the box. I didn't want to be on the chain. I wanted to be on the box. Yeah, it's more running, but it's also more learning. I'm right at the line of scrimmage. I'm talking to that short wing when we get a chance, when it's safe to talk to them. Do that. Learn from doing that chains. So remember, have that conversation with your chain crew. Remind them. And also remind your short officials. Get that relationship going with that chain crew because we don't want them moving the box before we call them down. Um, and again, this is an old uh, note I have on here, but Remember, this is for, in this particular game where I have the, these notes written up, it was a consolation game. It was the last time that these two teams were playing. So I had a note here saying this is most likely the last game for both teams. And when you get a scenario like that, it's for a large majority of the kids, it's probably their last football game, period. For those seniors, I should say. Not many of them are going on and playing college ball. It's still a very, very small percentage that are going on to play a Division three ball or anything like that, let alone going to Division one. So for a lot of them, it could be their last game. Let them remember the game, not us. But also, some of them may want to go out on a bang. So be on your toes. Because some kids know, well, this is my last game. And unfortunately, some kids do try to take liberties on other kids and try to take some cheap shots. So just have that reminder, have that conversation, okay? And lastly, I say, let's have some fun, okay? We've busted our butt all week, too. We, we know what we're supposed to do. Let's have fun. It is a game. Let's do our job. Let's be professional. But let's also have some fun and make it fun for these kids. So this is something that I'm going to go over with my crew every single pregame. And again, uh, like I said, this week, I'm filling in for my white hat, so I'm going to be working with my same crew. They've heard all of this stuff before, but it's still a great reminder every single pregame, okay, this is what we're looking to do. Now, because our white hat is not going to be there, I'm filling in for the white hat, that means we've got to substitute for our crew as an umpire. So it might be their first time hearing this speech. Let them know. Let them hear how you want to run your crew or what the expectation of your crew is. So always have this pregame conference. Now on this sheet that I'm going to, again, I'm going to have all this stuff published. I also have some other key reminders of different plays. Um, so we got a reminder for the kicker to put their hand up. Again, that's not a, a, a true rule because you can have multiple people kicking the ball just as long as they're within that five-yard box, not box, but within the five yards from the tee. Um, watch for kick-catching interference. We've had a couple teams that, that are notorious for it in our area. So they like to do some pooch kicks or, or different things like that. So we're just going over those different reminders. Um, have a reminder for that K cannot block until the ball has gone to 10 yards for any surprise onside kicks, different things like that. And reminder that ball not touched by R, that goes out of bounds is a foul. Um, and then I scroll down. I've got some other little things that we talk about. Uh, we talk about our six man and five man mechanics, depending upon the game. And if something were to happen where we've had it before, one of our officials gets injured or, or it becomes sick in the game. And we now have to transition from a six man crew to a five man crew. Now we have to adjust everything. So we, kind of go over very quickly our mechanics with that. Um, 
we talk about who's signaling offense, who's got the count for offense, who's got the count for defense, and let's try to kill it before the ball is snapped if they have 12 men on the field. That's a legal substitution as opposed to a legal participation. We try to do it right before the snap is eminent, giving them an opportunity to substitute that player out. But once we see that that snap is eminent, eminent, excuse me, let's kill it before that snap happens. Let's get it as a five-yard penalty instead of the 15-yard penalty. Uh, Talk to your wings again, working with each other, helping each other back, helping each other have each other's back for crackback blocks, blindside blocks, different things like that. Plays that go out of bounds. Deep wings come in. Let's help cover it up. Cover our short wings back. If we have to, we'll beanbag that spot. If we both got to get into that scrum to to going into uh, an opposition's bench. So help each other out, have each other's backs. And again, just set the reminders. Um, Let's see. First downs. Line judge, you oversee that. If it's close, let's tell us to take a look and let's tell us to spot it. So we're across from where the sticks are as our line judge. You're the one as the line judge that should be coming in. You know if that person got the line to gain or not. As a head linesman, we don't want to be turning around looking to see where the sticks are. It's a bad optic. Okay. We want to kind of just mirror where the ball is, get our spot, get our mark. Now, ideally, we want to know, okay, if they got the big line, it's going to be a first down. But if they're like one yard past the line of scrimmage, when you have your back to the sticks, you might not see that. So as the line judge, you're the one that's going to be killing the clock, saying we got a first down, pointing the chains, letting the chains get moved. And letting us know, okay, hey, this is close. And when I, as an umpire, hear that we got a close play going on here, I'm having that short wing come and spot the ball because they're the ones who saw it. And they're going to spot the ball where the play ended. They're not going to spot the ball outside the hash or in a different spot. They're coming in hard on anything close. They're coming in hard and they're spotting the ball. And then as a white hat, I'm going to come up, take a look. And if we have to, we'll kill the clock. And we'll bring the chains on in. But these are some of the short reminders that we're going to do with each other. Uh, 25 second clock and 40 second clock. We go over those. Again, we don't really talk about this too often now. We have a very experienced crew. But if you're getting a new crew, talk about it. When are we going with 25 as opposed to a 40 second clock? Okay. Let's get those things ironed out as soon as we can. We'll talk about scrimmage kicks. Um, we talk about our goal line and end line mechanics. These are two things that have changed a lot recently. Our association, our state association has changed them up a a couple different times, um, on where we want to be, but basically inside the five yard line, our short wings, they have the goal line. We want to get to the goal line first and work ourselves back seven yards and out. The deep wing still has the goal line seven yards and in. Our short wings have the goal line. We want to get there and reverse mechanic it back. Now we've also added if there is a line to gain before the goal line, we're getting to the line to gain first and then to the goal line. It's a mechanic that's kind of new for us this year. We used to go with goal line back to the line to gain. So we're kind of doing it this year to see how it is. Uh, We've talked about sideline management. Here in New Jersey, our lopsided rule is 33 points or more in the second half Um, and something that they recently just added once it goes into lopsided it doesn't come out so there's no longer a scenario where 33 to nothing or 33 point lead I should say and then all of a sudden against the backup team scores one touchdown and now we're back to a regular clock Again, unfortunately, this is where we see injuries occur. So our state has put it that once we go into lopsided, we're going to stay into lopsided. Um, and then some general information. And again, this is something that that my crew, we're, we talk about all the time after the game when we are going out for a beer, just different things. Stay wide, get the big picture. Okay. Let everything develop in front of you and then come and clean it up. Um If you got a team that's running the option, don't blow the whistle. See the ball first. Know that the player is down, that the ball is down, the play has ended itself before you blow the whistle. So many times, and I used to run the flex bone back in the day. 
Our quarterback would do a great ride and decide, faking it to the fullback, and now all of a sudden they're pulling it, and they're sprinting down the sideline, and everybody thinks the fullback has the ball, and there goes the quarterback down, and there goes somebody blowing the whistle because the fullback got tackled. See the ball, see the ball, see the ball. Our when in doubts. When in doubt, if it's a catch or no catch, we're going We're going to rule with the no, no catch. When in doubt of a forward or backward pass, we're going with a forward pass. We are trying to stay away from a fumble. Again, these are when in doubts. When in doubt between a fumble or the runner being down, we're going with the runner down. When in doubt in or out, we're going to keep them in. And on the line or off the line, we're going to help the receivers out to make them legal. Especially when you start getting those younger kids, uh, the substitutes in there, or you're working a JV and freshman game, help them out. They don't know what they're doing typically. Help them out. Last thing, and again, I've got our New Jersey rules, and I know this does change in all the different states, but our overtime rules. This is something that we typically aren't going to go over pregame-wise. Um, I actually have this printed out, and it's part of my cards that I keep in my pocket. So I have that if we ever get into a scenario where we're going to need to to go over it. I hand it to my white hat or me and myself. I go over and I'm reading it to the coaches. I'm reading it to the coaches on the home team. Then I'm going over and I'm reading the, the rules to the visiting team. I'm making sure that both teams are on the same page with what our overtime procedures are. Here in New Jersey... We're starting at the 25-yard line. There are chains, but there's no clocks. I know in other states, you're starting on the 3-yard line, maybe the 10-yard line. Each different state association has something different. Have somebody on your crew that definitely knows the rules. Have somebody on your crew that has a card, something that you can go up and you can discuss it with both coaches because if it's a first-year coach, they might not know the rules. If it's a 25-year seasoned coach, they may have forgotten the rules because they haven't been in an overtime game in the last five years. So have something there and have something concrete that you can explain to them. This is the situation that you want. This is what we're going to be doing. This is how it's going to be played out. Here in New Jersey, we're going with a max of three overtimes. On that third overtime, if the game is still tied, we got ourselves a tie game. That's our regular season. Playoffs, we're continuing. We're kind of going with the college rule. That third overtime, you got to go for two. Fourth overtime, still got to go for two. Again, talking playoffs. But everything else is, is pretty much standard. But we, we've kind of adopted the NCAA rule here for our overtime procedure. 25-yard line, defense can score, um, different things like that. So have something with you at all times. So, ladies and gents, that's been a lot of talking by me. Again, Mike D, the referee, here for you. Um, stay tuned for our next couple episodes where I am actually going to be having a couple of different crews coming on, and we're going to start talking about crew communication during the games, different things like that. So stay tuned for that. And once again, please check out the website. Go take a look. There it is right there. Okay, check out the YouTube page. Go on that YouTube page. Hit like, hit subscribe, hit all those fun different things. And lastly, again, if you're enjoying the show and you want to just throw me a little bit of a tip, I much appreciate it. But again, no obligation whatsoever. Okay, these are just some uh, little things that I've got out there as I stop sharing my screen right there. Once again, I will have the links to these documents on my Facebook page. So if you just look for Whistle Talk inside the mind of a referee, you'll find the documents there. They'll be up there when the episode is published. And we'll be able to uh, to help each other out. Once again, like, comment, give me a review. Tell me, Mike, I, I think your card is dumb. Or Mike, I think this card is fantastic. Help me out because I'm in the same situation that you are trying to make the game better for the kids. So if you've got a better idea, I am open to it. I'm not one of those people. It's my way or the highway. I'm open to hear what you got. So with that being said, thank you once again for tuning in to another episode of Whistle Talk. And I hope you are all having a fantastic season to this point. Keep it going. All right. Have a good night.